Good evening, and welcome to the Mayoral Forum sponsored by Northampton Neighbors. My name is Kenneth Dim, and I and Naomi Gerstel will serve as tonight's co-moderators. Naomi was a founding member of Northampton Neighbors and has been on the board of directors since 2017. I currently serve as the president of the board of uh, directors. First, let me just give a brief description of Northampton Neighbors. Uh, we are, are a member-driven, all-volunteer, nonprofit organization enabling older adults to live independent, engaged lives in their homes and communities. Established in 2017, Northampton Neighbors has enrolled nearly 1,000 members, representing every Northampton neighborhood and drawing from all economic, racial, and ethnic groups. There are no fees, so that uh, ensuring access for everybody to all of our programs. Our trained volunteers offer everything from household, uh, household help, errands, technical assistance, uh, to, uh, technical assistance to rides and phone, che phone check-ins. In addition, we provide opportunities to connect and share through programs and events such as the forum tonight, uh, interest groups, speaker series, talent shows, picnics, social gatherings, gatherings, et cetera. Okay, now a few just very brief administrative and technical notes. Tonight, we will be using a webinar format, not the Zoom meeting format, it's a webinar format, so that only the candidates and the moderators, Naomi and myself and the four candidates, will be on the screen and can be heard. We will have turned off, we will turn on the closed captioning feature if you would like to see this, the captions, please click on the box labeled CC at the bottom of your screen and activate the subtitles. The chat feature is not available during this presentation. After the candidates have responded to our questions, there will be a chance for you, the audience, to submit your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and I'll explain a little bit about that later. In addition, this program is being live streamed by Northampton Open Media. You can view it on channel 15 on your television. And it is also being posted on uh, Northampton Neighbors YouTube uh, channel, uh, in chat, this YouTube channel in 24 to 48 hours, and you can see it there as well. The Mayoral Forum will provide an opportunity for all four candidates to discuss the issues, answer questions from the audience, and respond to each other's comments. We'd like you to be specific, the candidates to be as specific as possible so that the audience can truly understand your positions and be able to differentiate one candidate from the other. The format, very briefly, is Naomi and, a and I will ask the four candidates to respond to questions that address some of the key issues in the mayoral race. Each candidate will be asked to uh, limit his, his or her answer to uh, about uh, two minutes. And if uh, time goes over, please be judicious in your use of time. If time uh, goes over, Naomi will very gently uh, interrupt and ask you to finish up. The second section will be approximately, that first section will be approximately 40, 45 minutes. The second section will be approximately 20 minutes in which we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, you can ask questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, type in your question, <clears throat> during any time during the presentation. Naomi will be scanning those questions. And when we come to the section two, she will ask those questions. If you have a question that you wish to direct to a specific, specific candidate, please do so. If it's a general question, then all four candidates will be, could, be, uh, could be asked, can be asked the question. In the third section, uh, which will also be approximately 20 minutes, the candidates will be able to respond to comments and questions to each other. We'd like this to be a lively uh, discussion. And we will end at 8.30, uh, pretty much on the dot. So let me introduce all four candidates. Uh, the, I'm going to read uh, the material, that, uh, the biographical material I'm uh, going to read is from uh, their websites or from uh, the information they provided us. And I'm reading them in uh, alphabetical order. So first candidate, Shauna Fischel has a rich experience working in special education as a special education teacher in the Boston Public Schools, where they were also a teacher union representative. Currently, they are an outreach social worker serving Western Mass adults who experience both mental health and substance abuse issues. 
Shauna has volunteered extensively for Planned Parenthood and Habitat for Humanity, and as a certified sex educator, group facilitator and trainer, entrepreneur, activist, community builder, and parent. Lately, Shauna co-founded the North Hampton Community Fridge, or Fridge, a mutual aid project to decrease food insecurity and food uh, waste in Northampton. Second candidate, Roy Martin, started as a commercial fisherman and as a teenager during the Vietnam era, joined the United States Marines where he was from which he was discharged honorably in 1981. Loving animals, he decided to uh, begin a start a pet store and then uh, began an antique business in New York State. Unfortunately, uh, he lost his two boys in a fire in 1980, which set him back many years. This tragedy led him to Northampton, where he found his way back into society through AA, Bill Nagel, and Anna Court, many different jobs, and being president of the Salvo House, Salvo Ten Tenants Association of Salvo House, excuse me. Third, Gina Louise Sciara. Sciara currently serves as Northampton's city council president, as well as the, the, their uh, council's, committee of, council's committee of finance, and is in her eighth year as the city councilor. She also works full-time, uh, she also works full-time as a communications manager for Pathlight, an organization serving people with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities and autism. Now the proud son Mom of two girls who attend Bridge Street School and JFK Middle School, Gina Louise's previous work includes uh, leading the $2 million capital campaign to save the first church's meeting house in downtown Northampton. And last, uh, Mark Warner. Um, Mark founded his company, Warner Transportation Consulting Incorporated, after receiving his PhD from MIT in 1992. He has since managed over 50 studies for transportation agencies throughout the US and internationally. Mark has also served on four city committees, written extensively for the Hampshire Daily Hampshire Gazette, and has been an active board member and treasurer since 2003 of Common Cause of Massachusetts, a nonpartisan group dedicated to holding elected officials to the highest ethical standards. With those introductions, let us proceed. As I mentioned, we will be asking each of the candidates a set of questions. Uh, there is a lot to cover, as I said, so please uh, limit your remarks to no more than two minutes. Naomi will serve as the timekeeper and gently cut people off if they're going too long. And let us begin with the first question. And I'll start with the uh, uh, first question is, and uh, first person I'll ask is Shauna, and I'll read the question. The population of seniors in the world and Northampton is expanding at a rapid rate. But seniors remain a population here and elsewhere, often invisible, stigmatized, and not included in discussions of diversity. Seniors are 18%, one in five, nearly one in five of the Northampton population, a higher percentage than in the country, state, or county. Yet none of the candidates who have websites mentioned seniors on their website. How would you as mayor, again, Sean, if you would be first to answer, how would you as mayor think about issues and policies for people over 55? Please, Sean. Thank you, Ken. Um, I do believe that I do mention seniors on the website, so I'm sorry that it's not bold and center because I think that it is a very crucial um, population that we have to address in Northampton, especially with the cost of living and cost of tax rates for uh, residential properties and seniors with fixed income are definitely under that umbrella that the cost of living in Northampton might not allow them to continue to live and retire here. I think that a few of the policies that we implement is first of all, increasing programs and services and personal connections like Northampton neighbor tries uh, and succeeds uh, on doing and ma really making sure that they feel connected and have support so they, their voice is heard when we make decisions that impact them the most. I think we have to uphold outcome-based practices. So the seniors 
in a very timely manner, because they don't have time to wait, uh, can benefit from those policies. And some of the issues that I think will really hate, uh, help is improve transportation. It's really hard to navigate the city if you don't have private vehicles. And many seniors, I'm sure, uh, put their bike aside at some point or other. And if you leave, live anywhere where, near where I live in Leeds, it's almost impossible to walk to a bus stop. So I think that making sure that services are accept accessible, transportation is affordable and timely and reaches all corners of our city, as well as it, making sure that we have universal design that is a step over just adaptability, but making sure that our streets, our sidewalks, our offices, our website, all of our services are designed so everyone can attain those services and act as those services, including uh, seniors, those with disabilities, and et cetera. Thank you. That was that was great. Was Thank great. you very much. And let me, pat, again, I'm going to just choose people uh, randomly. Everyone will have a chance to be first, last, and in the middle. Roy, if you could answer the same question, what would, uh, how would you as mayor think about issues and policies for people over 55? You're muted, Roy. Yeah, is it there? Yep, you, we can hear you. Now. Right. Uh, the first thing that, uh, you know, because I've been talking about it and talking about it with all the senior citizens, and the majority of them feel no more Prop 2 and a half overrides. I mean, you, the Prop 2 and a half override, the people with the money. Wait, wait, stop. R Roy? Roy, we can't hear you. Roy? Roy? Your mic's off. Try stopping and starting your mute button again. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, did you hear me before? Yeah. We heard you up to prop two and a half. Okay, right. Uh, the prop two and a half has been running people out of town. It's it's made for that. It's made for to make the property so high that people can't afford to live here. Uh, you know, a lot of people move from here to East Hampton, but East Hampton's starting to go up on their taxes. So where do these people live right now? They can't have another prop two and a half. I, I told them if I get elected, I would do everything in my power to keep from getting a prop two and a half override. Uh, you know, there's no need of it. We have to live within our budget, all right? And the seniors, right, they are the ones that are being hurt the most because they they don't have a job they don't have a place to go all right they don't they can't come up with extra money all right and most of the children don't live home anymore the ones that are working and stuff moved off in different cities so uh how do you keep raising taxes if you're not raising your income hey thank you roy thank yeah you. that's right uh next uh gina louise same question same question uh what, how would you as mayor think about issues and policy for people over 55? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Northampton Neighbors, for organizing this forum. Um, you know, briefly, when I looked back to when I first met Sarah Lennox, um, when I was a Ward 4 counselor, to talk about the concept of Northampton Neighbors, I was actually shocked that it was only winter of 2016 because I can't believe how much you all have accomplished and how established an organization is in such a short bit of time. Um, and thank you for the work. And it's certainly been crucial during the pandemic. Um, our older population is absolutely growing here in Northampton, um, and our actually our Northampton population between the two um, in this latest census has shown that it's grown a bit, a little bit, and older residents are a lot of that growth. My mother-in-law is one of those people, and I have an older family member who is excitedly moving here next month. Um, we are extremely fortunate to have a very experienced council on aging. We're also very fortunate that the executive director of the state Massachusetts Council on Aging is a longtime resident of Northampton. Um, and I'm very excited that we're an age-friendly designated community by the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative. Um, Just a minute, Troy, would you mute your mic? Oh, sorry. Thank okay. you. Um, that's, 
um, an important designation for us, but there's so much work that needs to be done around that. Talk to anyone with mobility issues and they will tell you that our sidewalks are incredibly hard to navigate as are our downtowns. Um, and we have a brilliant opportunity with our main street redesign to address some of these issues and to not just make sure that we're creating a downtown that is more people focused, but is absolutely accessible to all. Um, I would also like to see us become a dementia friendly community, um, which is a Mass Council on Aging program. There's state money for these to meet some of these goals. And I think we should really utilize that and really um, do more outreach and figure out how we can make some of these designations that we already have and other ones that we can aim for um, really embrace our older adult community. Thank Housing you. is, uh, sorry. Thank you. Are you ready? Can we move on? <laughs> Thank you, Louise. And uh, last, Mark, same question. Uh, how would you address the issues and policies for people over uh, 55? I think actually the other candidates made some good points there, too. One thing that we are doing right now with the pandemic is that the senior center at the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020 did cut the senior service bus, and that hasn't been restored. And yet there is still a mobility need. So I would hope that that would be something that would get some attention. But I think we have good professional staff at the Council of Aging, and they should be able to go and handle that and recognize the right priorities. And I hope they will get the input from the seniors. You know, there isn't also a monolithic group of seniors. There are people who have been long-term Northampton residents. They've been here for generations. And then there are those people who moved up uh, from other cities uh, more recently. There are different demographics, different attitudes about the city. And we have to recognize it. So there are gonna be different views that you wanna consider as people age. But one thing too, is that with regard to keeping, keeping, uh, keeping Northampton affordable for those people who are on fixed incomes, who are elderly, there is an opportunity for the city right now to go and defer some of the taxes if you meet certain income and age limits uh, and age thresholds until you sell the property. So it does provide an opportunity to stay in here. The rate is a, quite a bit higher than prime and it may be appropriate for the city not to act as a bank, but to consider a lower prime rate, a lower interest rate uh, for those taxes that they would uh, eventually collect when the, when the person does move or, or, or die. Okay, let's move on to the second question. Thank you. Um, so the second question, I'll start with Gina Louise. Um, where do you stand on the debate over the Main Street design? I just mentioned, the, uh, what options did you support and what option, excuse me, did you support and why? In favoring this option, did you take into account how it would support seniors? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, first, we should maybe explain, we're in line to get a one-time significant amount of money from the state, $16.6 .6 million. This is from the State Transportation Improvement Program. Um, that's not gonna happen again anytime soon, so it's important to spend this money really well. And we're getting this money because they have determined, based on our accident rates, that um, our downtown is very unsafe for pedestrians, but also for vehicles. We have a very wide downtown. Um, so of the options that were presented, I certainly, um, and most in favor and op of uh, in favor of option three. Although I will say that I again, this is a really important opportunity that we have, and I think that we should be really brave and bold with this opportunity and this money. Um, and you know, beyond safety concerns, Northampton faces big challenges primarily because of how our retail economy has shifted from brick and mortar to online shopping. And so we really need to think rethink how we use public space and what brings people downtown. Um, I, you know, option three does retain angled parking, um, which I know some people are really in favor of. Um, for some people with mobility issues, that is easier, but for others, it's not. Um, it's hard. It's hard with wheelchairs to use angled parking. Um, and I think that if we take into account how much the cars are changing and technology is changing and can use that space more for people and prioritize the parking that we retain for people who have mobility issues, that um, we can really change how we approach downtown. We don't want to redesign downtown for 1918, which is, um, I've, I've seen pictures as far back as 1918 of that angled parking. We need to think for the present and for the future, and we need to think for accessibility for everybody. And so I would really like us to be bold and brave with that plan. Great, thank you. 
Uh, Mark, same question. Uh, uh, how, where do you stand on the debate about Main Street, des uh, Main Street design? What option did you support? Why? And in favoring that option, uh, did you take into account uh, uh, seniors? Uh, I haven't actually endorsed any of the particular particular okay. options right now. Uh, the city has gone with option three. I suppose of the ones that they presented, those that was the best. I'm along go along with Gina Louise on this one too. That there are other considerations, and given that the only 25% threshold uh, for design is going to come up before the next mayor starts, there's still an opportunity for the next mayor to have an input. I'm concerned that the one thing that the city has promised it would do and I think is imperative as part of this type of study is to really understand what are the transportation impacts. So what is going to be the effect on, on visitors into downtown when you're changing parking? And what is the effect on adjoining streets as you constrain in some of the options, the traffic flow on Main Street? There are standard tools for this. This is part of what I've done for the last 29 years as a transportation professional. And tool, oops, and tool design group, which is the city's contractor and this is totally capable of doing that. So I do hope that they that the city does this. I think the state will require it as a condition for their $16.6 .6 million investment. And I hope that the tool design group also will get the city's, uh, city's authorization to go and look at the Main Street for Everyone proposal because I think there are some features of that that would be quite attractive and could make the downtown a very special place. Thank you. Um, next um, is Shana, same, obviously same question, Main Street design, what option and uh, how would it affect seniors? Thank you, Ken. Um, yes, I know that this is a very divisive issue across our city and everyone has very strong opinions. I wish that we were started program assessment, including stakeholders in the assessment uh, in a more outreach and bold kind of way 10 years ago when the city found out that it's unsafe and that applied for the grant. And I know that uh, I, I myself voted for option three when it came across the, uh, the public uh, forum. I do support um, more towards uh, Main Street for everyone because I think that it's more, up, uh, more accessible. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, that's, um, I think that it's more accessible in terms of uh, walking and crossing the streets and having green canopy, Frida, and having dogs when uh, you walk them downtown. Um, but I think we're also missing here an opportunity for creating a climate uh, rich uh, downtown. We're missing the opportunity to do geothermal batteries and district heating strange uh, and really and putting uh, fiber optics underground and really missing an opportunity in that regard. And in terms of seniors, other than having wider sidewalks and uh, easier accessible to bus stops, because oftentimes the DPW, when it plows the snow, it uh, plow, plows the snow, it blocks some of the entrances to the bus stops. So I think that making sure that when we widen the the sidewalks, we don't lose the DPW responsibility to clear the pathway so people can walk. And I think that if we had a more climate forward plan, we could actually retain some money from lost electricity. And therefore, when we go back to what we think about fixed income for seniors, we have to reduce our expenses. And one way to do that is with climate focused electricity and loss of waste. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, last, um, uh, Roy, uh, uh, same question, obviously, uh, your position on uh, Main Street design, uh, which option you supported if you, dis if you did support an option and how that would support seniors. You're, you're muted, my, uh, Roy. Turn your mic on, please. Thank you. Come on. No, you muted no. again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. You turned green finally. You're, 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 we can't hear you, Roy. Roy, turn it off and on again. Roy? I have to use a paper bag, all right, and, or else carry a bag of their own. And... Roy, can yeah. I ask you just to start off because we missed a lot of what you said. 
Okay. Is it coming in clear now? It's clear. It's clear now. Okay. I'm saying that because they're senior citizens, right, and they don't want to park way down at the parking garage or down at the parking lots and walk all the way back up uptown. By the time they get uptown, they're all tired out. Oh, yeah, if they go shopping uptown, if they don't have a bag, give them a paper bag, and then they go outside, and if it's raining or misty, right, stuff breaks, goes all over the place. And what senior citizen is going to carry a whole bunch of stuff that they bought up on Main Street down to the parking garage or down below? None that I know of. They all said the same thing, right? You know, they would go out to, out to the shopping malls. So, uh, in order to... Well, lost you, Roy. Roy, we can't hear you. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> the park tickets. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Somebody. Somebody was cutting in there. Uh, yeah. But anyways, right? Yeah. That. That. I don't. I'm not in favor of changing Main Street. I'm in favor of in the winter time when it snows. Right. It snows today, tonight, you got the trucks out there and everything hauling the snow away so the main street is clear. All right, that hasn't been done since Mary Ford was here. All right, when Mary Ford was here, she had a few good things that she put into, into the service. Okay. And, uh, you know, and that, that's about all I can say about that whole thing. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Roy. You got to think about the senior citizens and think. A lot of them have walkers, all right? A lot of them have canes. Roy, we're going we're gonna to go on to the third question. Go, go, go. go. I'm you. <laughs> Thank you. This is a question that's also raised uh, or addresses a fair amount of uh, um, publicity and controversy in the city in recent, uh, recent months. How can and should the mayor respond to neighborhood issues, for, exins, for, for an instance, when a neighborhood wants a stop sign, speed bumps, or cherry trees? So what's the response of the mayor? How can we, the mayor respond to community, uh, community interest, community pressure, community uh, input? Uh, we'll start with this, Mark, please. Sure, the, those are all different issues. Well, the stop sign and the speed bumps, for stop signs, there are standard warrants. And if the road has a, has a certain traffic speed and uh, amount of vehicles coming into it and it warrants a stop sign, according to the standard warrants, it should get one. Uh, I'm not sure how many cases there are like that in the city. Um, if it's just been derelict and not putting one up, well, then certainly do it. Uh, if, with regard to the speed humps, this is also a thing too where you want to look to make sure there is consensus of the neighbors there if they want to slow the traffic. Some it, It's not always a uniform decision. Sometimes there are neighbors who, who don't want the, the speed hump in front of their house. Uh, this is also one too, though, where the city can do some traffic measurements and determine whether it's appropriate. So there are some expert things that you can get to evaluate it. Cherry trees, and there would be other examples of this too, where some neighbors are gonna have a different view from what the city has proposed. With regard to the Pacific of the cherry trees on Warfield Place, this is one where the there may have been some questions about what were the warrants that pushed Warfield Place onto the top of the list to get it. Given that that list should be moving up over time, it's odd that it was even there that it was a surprise to so many people. I think this is one where you obviously have to go listen to the community, but ultimately you have to go and uh, revert, to, you know, yield to your experts as well, what they believe is in the best interest for the city as a whole and try and make a convincing case to those neighbors and understand that while you are doing this with regard to the cherry trees, you're losing the cherry trees in this case, but you're also gaining greater accessibility and smoothness of your road, your sidewalk, and ultimately a new set of trees that will serve your neighborhood too. And I think that this is a case too, where you will find that even in that case, where there was a strong opposition against the city's action, there were some residents on the block too who said, I would prefer not to go and defer the repairs to our street any further, even if it means that we lose these grand old cherry trees. Okay, thank you, Mark. 
Uh, again, um, uh, same question. Uh, how does the mayor respond to these kinds of neighborhood issues, uh, whether they're speed bumps or stop signs or cherry trees? And I'm sure there are other, obviously, loads of other issues as well. And Shana, you could uh, respond next. Thank you. Yes, this is another divisive issue, like many others in our city. I am, as many others on Warfield Place, saddened by uh, the destruction of the cherry trees. And I think that the use of police force to bulldoze the trees is a way to, uh, is a example of waste in our city planning, waste of the police force, and waste in our budget. If there is such a dissent of a majority of the population, the mayor needs to listen. And I think the mayor listening and being a conduit between different parts and different opinions between the city is the main part that the mayor needs to take. In addition to that, I, uh, if elected, I will reverse the administrative code, putting, uh, nominating municipal staff and appointing the chairs, and instead will make sure the commissions have the freedom to nominate leaders. I think that that's one way that the mayor can ensure that the residents' opinion are necessary. As, and it, that can also be when we talk about stop signs and um, other infrastructure changes. There's always going to be multiplicity of opinions. However, we can't always go by the algorithm. I think that Northampton can be a very uh, can be a model city. It's had historically be been a unique government, and I think that we need to start to consider human subjectivity and human opinion more than just numbers and who passes that um, that line of the street that needs to be accessible. And again, when we talk about ADA, one thing that I talk about a lot is universal design. Universal design is not just ADA compliance, it lot, goes a lot further. And part of you does a personal design and making sure that it's accessible for everyone without needing to change. And some of that is also the mental health of our population. Now the Warfield Place, that community is divided and the mayor's job right now is to bring those that neighborhood together. Shana, thank you. Thank you, Shana. Uh, same question for Roy. Uh, how can and should the mayor respond to these neighborhood issues, such as stop signs or cherry trees uh, um, and, and neighborhood neighborhood interests? Roy, you're muted. If you could turn off your, uh, if you could turn on your mic and please uh, respond. There. Ah, I got it this time. Is it unmuted? It's unmuted. You're okay. Now, all right. Now you're talking about them little things, all right? Now we have a church down on Holly Street. That's also a neighborhood thing, all right? And the whole of Ward Three is all involved with that church, trying to save the church from getting torn down. Uh, we have a company come in there. They're going to charge seven hundred and eighty-one thousand dollars for one condo apartment. Can you imagine that? What's that going to do to our tax base? You know, uh, you know, we're fighting it, right? I'm in Ward Three, so I'm I'm all in favor of fighting for it. But stop signs and stuff like that. Now the city has a way of taking care of that stuff. You go to the planning board. The planning board puts it up there, and if the majority of the planning board figures okay. All right. But right now, I believe our planning board is down one person or two people. I'm not sure because this was holding up the church, the church thing. So uh, what we have to do is make sure all our boards are full and people are in there. That's the number one thing for the city. The city has to work on putting itself together. Right now, this city is kind of tore apart. Every one of our Every, everything, every other department we have is short people, right? The police department, that's another thing. It's short people. And the police department uh, just, you know, they don't have enough people to put out there at night. But they do. They put a few people out there at night. But, I mean, uh, not like it used to be. They used to put bike people out there on bicycles. All right? You don't see them around anymore. Uh, yeah. We need to move on. Yeah. Thanks, Roy. If you can move this forward, thank you. And uh, last, Gina Louise, uh, same, obviously, same question. How how would uh, you, as the mayor, 
uh, respond to these neighborhood issues when interests uh, uh, percolate up from the neighborhood? How, how, how should the mayor respond? Um, these are very different examples that you've given. And we, right. for, so it, the sort of more traffic calming examples, the so stop signs, speed bumps, we have a transportation and parking commission. I was the vice chair of it for quite a few years. Um, and there are processes, as was mentioned, you know, stop signs actually have to meet certain requirements to be allowed to put a stop sign. Um, and uh, speed humps, we have a traffic calming process that, that the Transportation Parking Commission goes through. Um, so those are very different examples um, and are not necessarily something that the mayor is going to be involved with. Um, now, something like paving is ultimately the mayor's decision whether something's going to be paved or not. Um, and, you know, for that example, if I had been in the mayor's office at the time, I would have worked harder earlier in the process to lead a dialogue and hear from all sides and, and explore options. Um, and I, you know, I believe really strongly in community input and collaboration and finding consensus. But, you know, sometimes at the end of the day, the mayor does have to make a decision. Um, and but for, you know, community um, discussions that generate a lot of passion and feelings, I think it is important for the city to, to work with the neighbors. But, you know, I'm really, I'm glad that we've actually moved away from this. You, there are stories that are told of years in the past where um, if you did know a city councilor or um, if you were in tight with the mayor and you wanted a stop sign, you got one on your street. I'm really glad we no longer have that system. We have um, a system that's more equitable and fair and where um, if people have concerns, they can bring it to a body that has um, resident representatives on it, and it can be really vetted for um, whether it's appropriate for that, you know, for, for whatever their remedy is that they're seeking. Naomi, I see you leaning in. Leaning. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Jean Louise. Um, and um, I guess that's it oh, before I answer that question. Let's move on to the fourth question. Um, uh, also, uh, a question that has uh, uh, addresses a fair amount of controversy and discussion over the last number of months. Several of you and the city and state uh, support the creation of a Department of Community Care. Are there models, this, uh, this multi-part question, so bear with me. Are there models in other similar sized cities as Northampton that you are using to create and develop this department? Specifically, how do you envision this department coordinating care with other emergency first responders, police, fire, EMT, uh, et cetera, uh, or uh, emergency mental health workers. And let me be more specific. Let's say 911 gets a phone call at one o'clock in the morning reporting what sounds like a domestic violence or incident. How would this be handled? Okay, so again, multiple questions there. Uh, but uh, if you could address this with some specificity, that would be great. Roy, would you, would, could you stop, please? You, Mike, you, you're muted, Mike, Roy. How's that, better? That's better. Okay, uh, something like domestic violence, you definitely want to send a police because a lot of times in domestic violence, and we've seen it, matter of fact, just this week in uh, uh, East Hampton, all right, where the police went, they had someone with them, uh, and when they went, uh, the person they went to take care of uh, ended up getting arrested. Now, he got arrested because he assaulted the cop. Now, you know, things like that, people are saying, well, the community care is a good thing. Well, when we started the, the Grove Street Homeless Shelter, which I was a tenant there for a while, all right, I won't deny it, but when we started the Grove Street Homeless Shelter, all right, it was a city councilor that went out there and broke the lock off the door. He ended up getting arrested, but then they dropped the charges. And we ended up with Grove Street Homeless Shelter. Yeah, so that was something that worked out good for the homeless and put the homeless in the right place. Uh, you know, for a long time, there was no homeless down street. And Bill Nagel's brought him along, and there was no homeless down street. So there was no problems. Now, that was supposed to be like the community care. All right, that whole system was set up just like community care. All right. 
I, you know, I say, okay, we'll give it a shot, but I mean, we're not going to give them millions of dollars, right, and have them hire a whole bunch of people, and then uh, two years later, they're firing them people, or laying them people off because it didn't work out. Let's take it one step at a time if you're going to do that. Get it working, and, you know, right, because nothing works if you just pour money into it. All right, a business don't work if you just pour money into it. You have to have the know-how and the lack behind it. And you have to have the people who want to work to get the people so they can get them homes. Right, which I don't see, like, ServiceNet. I don't see them getting anyone homes. Right, I don't see any one of these places. Right, I think some of this will come back to another question, so I think you should... Yeah, okay, right. So, anyways, uh, that's that's my thought on it, right? If you could uh, mute yourself. Um, yeah. uh, uh, next, Gina Louise, again, same uh, same question around the Department of Community Care, and, and specifically, if you could address that 911 call at 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, there was there are a lot of components to this question, so I'm going to try to get to them. Um, so, you know, I, I co-created the Northampton Police and Review Commission with the mayor, um, and I fully support this recommended this primary recommendation of theirs to um, implement a Department of Community Care, and um, will absolutely support the 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 implementation process this year to get us operational in the next year. Um, and you you also asked about what kind of models. So this is it's a similar model to a Cahoots model, the Cahoots model in Eugene, Oregon, but it's actually very different. That's a contracted agency. And this is going to be a city department with secure, you know, um, funding from the city budget, and that was a really important component of it to the policing review commission, um, and is a big difference between from ours and Cahoots. But I think that they made a really strong case for why it's important to bring it in as a city department. Um, so it's, and you also you asked about um, how it's going to work with our other public safety departments. That's absolutely crucial, and that's a lot of what this implementation year is about: is figuring out that structure and figuring out how it's going to be, um, how those departments are going to work together. We have an incredible dispatch department already, so that's a real strength that we start with: is that our dispatch is is professional and ready. And um, they will work with the implementation director who we're hiring to figure out how that line of service and those calls will, um, will come to them and, and how that will be determined and how that will work with the other departments. Um, to get to your 911 call, domestic violence calls are some of the most dangerous calls and um, the, some of the trickiest unknown calls that um, police usually go out on. So for me, I would never wanna put a community care um, response person into a dangerous situation um, where we don't know that they're going to be safe and that um, and so you know for something like that again so community care also is something that someone would be able to request so if someone's not requesting that service and it sounds like it could be a dangerous situation I would not send a community care person I would send a police officer to or um, to that response if they were requesting it and it still seemed like a potentially volatile and dangerous situation, I would wanna make sure that they had backup and that they were being sent into a safe situation with a police officer. Thank you, uh, Gina Reese. Mark, uh, same set of questions around the Department of Community Care and, and uh, if you could be as specific as possible and, and uh, possibly even address that 911 one well, well, Gina Louise is right on this one, too. We do have a very capable dispatch uh, that knows how to handle any type of emergency 911 call. They would have the expertise, they would have the knowledge and experience to go and figure out what is the right response. I, I don't feel that I would want to go and make a, 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 a categorical decision about what would be the right circumstance, what right type of uh, response that the city should send, but the dispatch would know how to do this and I would go and trust their judgment. Um, and I think they would understand what the, what the issues are and who would best be able to handle it. The Department of Community Affairs, Department of Community, Department of Community Cares is a good idea. This is a service that will be essential. It will be valuable to Northampton and I hope that we do uh, get it right. I think it, the people, the staff there will work effectively with the police and understand the type of calls that come in and how to handle it. Their services will go beyond the emergency response. So there's also an outreach service that they will provide for dealing with mental health issues, substance abuse, outreach to the homeless and uh, people the more down and out in the city and be able to go and steer them to the right types of services and healthy alternatives. 
So I think that is valuable and the city is putting in, uh, doing the study now, is about to do it in the coming fiscal year, to look at what, how to design this system, what is the staffing going to be for the budget we've got, and to come up with a plan going forward. It's also something where the, uh, the, the department will get into place. And I think CAHOOTS, the one out in Eugene, Oregon, is something that showed up often as a model. It recognized that CAHOOTS is a very tiny percentage of the public safety budget for Eugene, Oregon. It's one or two percent. So any estimation here that it was going to be a 50 percent uh, response, that that would be ideal, it is, is really misunderstanding the relative role of Department of Community Cares relative to the police. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. And, and Shana, uh, same, same question regarding Department of Community Care and uh, you know, your position on it, your, your sense of it, and, and how we would coordinate the first responders in that, nine, that the 1 a.m. Uh, 1 a.m. 911 phone call. Mm -hmm. So um, as a social worker working with uh, folks with co occurring disorders, substance use, and uh, mental health, facing homelessness, as well as in my past, I was also a couples therapist and uh, help uh, moderate between couples that have experienced domestic violence in the past. This is uh, an area that I am professionally uh, would consider myself very well informed on all the ins and outs, and that there is no uh, set solution. And I think no matter what community we compare ourselves to, Northampton is a very unique place, and we have uh, an opportunity to, to for us to be the model city for other cities in Massachusetts and New England to respond to. And I think that the fact that our dispatch is staffed by civilians is very important to continue because that means that they will be able, like uh, my peers here have said before, uh, to be able to navigate the conversation and to understand is the police or is the department community care uh, their appropriate response. However, when we're talking about DV at one o'clock in the morning, I don't know if you were talking about a cisgender couple with a man and woman, a queer couple, a couple that uh, is uh, of color that have children and all those attributes are severely important to understand because most of those marginalized groups, if you send a cop to resolve the issue, the issue will escalate. And you have to be very delicate with how you resolve domestic violence. We have to really understand that if we are a true progressive city, we must hold values for the maximum benefits for the different franchise folks. And this is the focus for the Department of Community Care. Because like Roy said, the, the DV in um, East Hampton, one of the people assaulted the cops. If there were children there, we want to de-escalate as social workers, as peer specialists, which will be the ones that stop, uh, staff the department. We are trained and we have lived experience to de-escalate domestic violence. And I will wholeheartedly prioritize De Department of Community Care to be fully trained and fully capable of resolving these issues in our community. Uh -huh. Thank you, Shana. Um, last question of, of in the first section, and it's, uh, it kind of touches, uh, it's in some ways similar or, or touches the uh, issue of uh, Department of Community Care, I think. Uh, and that's how would you deal with people experiencing homelessness in downtown, <clears throat> excuse me, Northampton? And did the mayor make the right decision to clear out Pulaski Park? Okay, if uh, Mark, uh, you could begin the uh, response. Yes, that is an issue for the Department of Community Cares. And I think the outreach services and the staff they hire should be prepared to go and encounter, you know, to go and seek out <coughs> the homes, uh, where they are and steer them to services and recommendations so that they can help them. Another part of this, of course, is recognizing the, looking at the underlying causes of, of why they're homeless. Is it a mental health issue? Is it a substance abuse? Is it just being down and out coming from someplace else? But Northampton also is, uh, the type of compassionate city, as it should be, that should also look to make sure that there are shelters and affordable housing, to the extent that we can afford it, services provide, uh, you know, to help get people back on their feet. The mayor, however, was right to go and clear out Pulaski Park the way he did. I think he actually should have done it beforehand. It took an incident where somebody got stabbed uh, to people who were essentially being as residents of the park there, uh, to make it a catalyst for some change, some action. But right now, Pulaski Park is not functioning as a park 
for the people of Northampton. People don't bring their kids to Pulaski Park the way they once did, the way I did, for example. And this is one where we have to be conscious of treating the, the homeless people, the panhandlers downtown uh, and seek services for them through the Department of Community Cares. But we also have to recognize that we have an obligation to the downtown merchants and residents of Northampton as well. This is a source of our employment. This is a source of our property and meals tax and property tax. This is a source of our quality of life. And it is being undermined and the city while it should seek compassionate means, non-criminal means to deal with these people, there are, there are measures on the books against aggressive panhandling, against uh, smoking pot in, in public, uh, against uh, littering, against uh, trespassing. And there's a point where the city just has to say, we're obliged to go and enforce those rules too. Thank you, uh, Mark. Shana, same question about the Pulaski Park. Uh, and specifically, would, did the mayor make the right decision in, in clearing out the park? I think that uh, city officials have not done enough. It's been, it, they waited too long to address the issue of houselessness in our city. And I think that what we have seen is that the condition is worsening and not getting better. When we clear out the park, we're, we're just pushing the, the problem away. We are not re solving the issue. There has been a tremendous lack of consultation uh, consultation with those most impacted. I've spoken to many um, houseless individuals and homeless uh, people that are on the street and asked everyone that I spoke to, have they been consulted regarding the Resilience Hub or have they been consulted about what they knew the community and none of them have. So they feel out of the of the conversation. So no, no wonder that the condition has worsened. And we just have to look at the nation and other uh, dense cities, especially on the West Coast, to see that we are in a housing crisis. We need to redirect short-term resources like emergency shelters and really invest in permanent supportive housing. And one of the policies that I aim to bring is housing first. It's an evidence-based practice to eliminate homelessness by providing permanent housing with no conditions. When I work with houseless individuals, I have to make sure that they are sober, that they are stable in order to get them housing. But one of, but for, with, if a person doesn't have permanent housing, that person is also not gonna get sober. So we need to make sure that we have the, the resources, that we have the systems in place so we prevent the situations from getting worse. Great, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, same question, obviously, for uh, Gina Louise um, in terms of Pulaski Park, and uh, would you would you agree with the mayor's decision to clear it out? And how, in general, would you uh, address people uh, experiencing homelessness? Um, well, we know that we have a houseless population, and they're they're part of our community. This is not unique to Northampton, although we do I think embrace them as part of our community in ways that other places don't. Um, there's a housing crisis throughout the country right now. And obviously the Supreme Court's overturning of the eviction moratorium is, is um, only gonna make this matter worse. And we know that, um, that eviction um, numbers are going up um, as are foreclosure numbers. So um, this, is, this is a problem. And there actually, I was in a meeting this morning, a COVID response task force meeting about this issue. Um, there are region, there are nonprofits and faith organizations and individuals and the municipalities are working very hard and trying. We, there are resources that are coming from the state and actually from the federal government. But as we've said, like there are just not enough units. We need to find a way to create more units for people. And, um, and also the, you know, there are even emergency vouchers that have become available, but, um, but our rents are too high to qualify for them. So we, we need to find a way to create more units for people to be able to um, get into and get into stable housing. In terms of Pulaski Park, it had become an unsafe situation. Um, and I know that everyone who was moved, they, they had sort of moved in fairly recently to that spot and they had worked, the, you know, the city worked with local agencies and outreach groups to contact each individual who was there and work with them at that moment to try and figure out where they could move to that would be more stable for them. Um, but, you know, as it has been said, it had become an unsafe situation for anyone in the park, including the houseless community who, um, you know, there, there were some violent uh, situations that happened. And so we need to be able to have our community space. That's 
Flasky Park and that area near City Hall, that's vital community free speech space that we take, we hold very dear. Um, and that needs to be available to everyone and feel safe for everyone. And, um, and so I think this was a situation where the mayor did need to step in and move people, but I know that they worked incredibly hard with, the, um, with local groups to find solutions for that immediate problem. Thank you, Gina Reese. And last, Roy, if you could unmute yourself, uh, address the same question about the home, uh, people experiencing homelessness and uh, typically the mayor's decision. <laughs> I'm done. I'm bad, you know. Now, right, when people are talking about the homeless and the situation over in the park, yes, the mayor should have, actually, the mayor shouldn't have, the chief of police should have sent in police there and cleaned up the park and checked IDs and stuff like that, which they probably did. I don't know what they did, but checked and checked for weapons and stuff like that. Because some of them, you know, and I've heard this from some of the homeless, there's a few of them who's carrying guns. And so, right, it makes it a real severe situation. Now, right, uh, I spoke to a lot of the homeless. A lot of them come over from Holyoke because they were being pushed in Holyoke. Some come from Springfield. Uh, there's uh, six people who come and stand out there with signs, disabled vet. They come in the van every morning and they stand out there all day. And then what they get, they turn over to the driver of the van right? and they go back. They have, a, they have a home over in Holyoke and they go back there. Now, I know this because I know the people, you know, and I, I go to Holyoke every day and, you know, go to the car lot and see people there and talk to people. So I know what's going on with the homeless, right? There's a lot of them. You ask them. Are you a vet? They say, yeah, all right. Well, how come you don't go up to the VA and get something? Oh, no, they won't help me. I said, why won't they help you? I said, have you got your DD-214? Oh, what's that? They don't even know what a DD-214 is. That says everywhere you was and everything you did while you were in the military. All right. I know one guy, he was in the military two days. And he puts disabled vet. Well, he, he was in there for two days. And the city has given him benefits and everything through the Veterans Services Office. So, and they all can go to the Veterans Services Office. So, you see, the homeless, right, have different things if they want to take advantage of it. But they don't want to take advantage of it. A lot of them are just lazy. And then there's other ones who just want to fill their pocket. And when they get enough money, they move on somewhere. All right. And we're going we're to move on as well. Yeah. Thank, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roy. And uh, mute yourself, please, again. Uh, and thank you for the, uh, uh, that's the completion of uh, the first section in which we, we asked uh, uh, the questions. And now we're going to proceed to the second section. Uh, we're uh, just about on schedule, maybe slightly behind, uh, in which we're going to take some questions from the audience. Uh, if you still, you, you can uh, submit Roy, can you mute your? Uh, can you mute yourself? We're hearing a lot of noise. Thank you. Um, uh, you can still ask questions by going to the Q and A uh, at the bottom of your screen and, and typing something in. And uh, please indicate uh, if you haven't already if it's for a specific candidate or for or all in general. And uh, if you if you want the name to appear, you can have your name appear. If you want an anonymous, you can click the anonymous uh, uh, button. So with that. Uh, I think uh, Naomi is going to kind of take over and uh, scan the questions and and uh, and ask. Um, I'm going to do that, and I'm, I'm afraid we're not going to have time to get through all the questions, but we'll get through as many as we can. And let me begin with the first one. Hello, my name is Fred Zimmick. I live in Ward 3. As mayor, what would you do to persuade Coca-Cola from leaving Northampton? <sighs> And can I just interrupt, if we can make this really short, because we don't have a lot of time, as people like, you know, 30, 45 seconds, 60 seconds at the most, that would be great. Anyone? Who wants to begin? Uh, sure. Well, I think actually the time to try and persuade Coke from uh, not leaving, you know, kind of passed. But I would hope that, that the city, and the day that was announced in the Gazette, I did send a letter to uh, the mayor and to uh, Annie Lesko, the head of the economic development in the city, to find out if they knew anything more than was in the Gazette. I was concerned that, they, uh, that there was a 
that there was some municipal role that may have taken place there. Was our, they're the largest water consumer in the city? Was there something we could have done, a low cost capital investment to provide more water or perhaps change the rates while still being fair to the other rate payers in the city? But I'm hoping now that the issue isn't so much about trying to convince COPE to stay, but to try and find somebody else to take over the plant. And I'm hopeful that that is an option. The Coke has invested a lot in that plant and that maybe one of their contractors that they use in other of their plants elsewhere in the country would find that this is a suitable location and it can work for them. Right. So I think that's something to emphasize. Thanks, Mark. Any uh, other response? Uh, anyone else want to respond to uh, short, Shana? Yeah, um, I actually do not want to persuade Coke from staying. I understand that we're losing uh, a numerous amount of jobs, uh, substantial tax uh, rate and uh, water fees. However, I would prefer to see that we have secured green jobs, union-backed industry. Coca-Cola has not been friendly to its workers historically, and we have to really make sure that Northampton brings and attracts union-backed industry and labor, especially this is about opportunity with the current crisis to think about hydroelectricity, a uh, green drop that produce, produce uh, materials for renewable energy, making ma making Smith Oak more attractable maybe for a youth in Northampton and residents, not just for the region, and have some kind of uh, bigger partnership between our industry and our youth. I think that we have to attract sound business and have competitive contract and the fact that uh, Coca-Cola polluted the river um, and then left three months later, I think like Mark, something went there beyond what we know. And I actually am um, happy that they're left and I think this is an opportunity for industrial growth. Can you talk for a bit about this? Back to the next question. Naomi, it's hard to understand you, sorry. Say that again, Naomi. You know, Roy, do you want to make a final comment or we should we move on to the next? Uh, yes, that worked. All right. Okay. Uh, I remember when Coca Cola first moved in here, and I believe, and it was Mary Ford, right, that was signed up to them so that they would move in here. And at first, they weren't going to move in because they didn't have a railroad crossing, they didn't have any railway there. So then Mary Ford made it possible. Then the next thing, they caught fire along the railroad line. All right, you know, that caused a big dispute. And then the water thing. And they got a big, they got all kinds of tax incentives, which are due up. They won't get them in this year. You know, uh, you know, they had them for like 20 years, 25 years, they had a tax incentive, X amount of dollars and stuff like that. And it was worked with the city, so it'll move here. Now, the only thing they were doing here wasn't Coca-Cola that they were bottling. They were bottling uh, the drinks, all right, Powerade, stuff like that. So uh, we're losing 300 jobs, but it's up to us, the people of the city, not just the mayor, not just the city council, but us, the people in the city, to come up with some idea to use that property, all right? And... Because they're moving out, they they should have to pay X amount of dollars to the city. I mean, they're not going to leave derelict buildings. They're going to have to pay taxes on them. Okay, so Gina, do you want to have? I do. Thank you. Um, Roy's right. You know, actually, uh, Coke does have a TIF, and it's quite convenient that their TIF expires. Um, the same month that they are planning on closing. Um, you know, the loss of the Coca-Cola bottling next June is a big hit, there's absolutely no question. And we are a victim of a larger corporate restructuring that they're doing. I feel like an I can answer a lot of your questions, Mark. Um, they are outsourcing or closing their own bottling plants. Um, and we are a victim of that and it's lousy and I will do everything I can to push them to at least give their over 300 employees a fair and just severance. I agree, I would love to get a union employer in there. Um, you know, Northampton has supported and invested in their operations there and the very least that they can do is do right by their workers. Um, so I'll do everything in my ability to bring another bottling business into that plant that will utilize the water and sewer infrastructure that we adapted for their volume. Um, and that also will minimize the impact on our water and sewer enterprise. Um, and you, need to, you need to mute your, you need to mute my, Roy. Roy, what do you do? Oh. 
Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. The next question is from Robert Mirpool, and he says, the centralization of power in the mayor's office has created distance between neighborhoods and city halls. This has left community members on Warfield Place, in Bay State, and Village Hill feeling ignored and disrespected by city officials. If elected, will you work on charter revision to give the city council more power so that we can become a less bureaucratic and more neighborhood-oriented city? Who wants to begin, Chana? Yes, I, uh, I commit to reverse the administrative code that mayor and our courts have imposed, uh, and I said it before, in which he um, uh, puts uh, department as committee chairs, and I would like commissions to elect their own residential le leadership, especially in the forestry, the DPW, the transportation, sustainability. And I would also create um, one of the two of the policies that I also want to bring in to the city is neighborhood improvement planning. So ma making sure that some of the tax funds stay within neighborhoods. I live in Leeds, and we uh, many people here feel that the tax money continuously goes to North Hampton and the the 40% of the population that live downtown and we are uh, left out, uh, as well as participatory budgeting. So we will have more input from residents in, in, the, in the budgeting process. So the vi visions and values of the residents are reflected in our city practices. Thank you. Does anyone else wanna to respond to this question, Gina? Sure. Um, so our charter was completely revised in 2012. It's not that long ago. And that actually defined the powers of the executive and the legislative branch. Um, the mayor, may, people may not know this. Well, you did if you lived here then. Um, the mayor used to control the agenda for the city council and would preside over the city council meetings. Um, so that has very much changed. And we now have two separate branches of government and, and you have to be able to work with the city council to accomplish the goals that the mayor wants to accomplish and basically to move anything forward. Um, and that you know, was a very participatory process to get to that change in, in how the government was structured. Um, and it involved representatives from every ward. Um, it involved the mayor, the city council, independent groups of residents, lots of public input. It was a very long process. Mark can speak to it. He was part of that process. Um, and then we, as is in the charter, you go through a charter review every year that ends with a nine. So we just finished a charter review process in 2019. Um, and that is a long process. It's that took about a year. Um, and then we are just now the legislature just in the last few weeks has started to approve some of the provisions of the charter changes that we made. So that is a large, a, a long process that the city does go through periodically. And so in the last 10 years, we actually have done pretty extensive charter reform um, twice. Roy or Mark? Mark? Or I'll, I'll step in. Yeah, thanks, Gina, for bringing that up with regard to the charter change. That was, I was on that 2012 charter change, and that was one of the issues that I endorsed very strongly, is saying, look, we have a separate set, set of two branches of government here in the council and the mayor. There's no reason why the mayor should have to go and run the council. It's time for the council to stand on its own feet and to provide that consent and advice to the mayor. I hope they do go and use that. The other piece too, though, is that I think the key thing is that the mayor has to be honest with the neighborhoods. The city and services and departments have to be that way too. In Bay State Village, where I live, there has been, we have taken a lot of the issues in terms of the uh, the, the zero lot line zoning, the zoning infill, the second structure on the, within the lot. And I'm wondering, I've never been clear whether these were something that were really true to the ostensible mission of making the city more environmentally friendly, or if it really was just the mayor's approach of saying, this is a way to raise property taxes outside of the two and a half constraint, proposition two and a half constraint. If that's the case, and that's a legitimate case to, to make. If that is the case, then be honest about it. Don't use some ostensible cause for it. Be honest with the people to evaluate whether that is a trade-off we want to make. I'm not sure in many cases that these goals are worth the cost in terms of the trade-offs. In terms of, if I may just put in one other point too, I, I don't think it's appropriate for citizens to go and be the chair of advisory committees to the city for the Department of Transportation or DPW for the city's DPW or for several of the other departments for planning either. These are things that uh, you do want to have some expertise. Of course, go and hear the neighbors, of course, go and make sure that you have input from the communities. But you want ultimately to have the expert in the city and the city, uh, you hope, will have hired people who are expert and the mayor should hold them accountable if they're not. 
Okay, Roy, do you want the last uh, to speak for just a short period on this, or should we move on? If you do, you have to uh, 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 unmute yourself. There, am I unmuted? <laughs> okay, uh, you know, just several little things here that I'm that I'm looking at that I'm thinking about. Things like when we did the roundabouts. All right, not many people in the city here was really. Yeah, I uh, talked about the roundabouts. The roundabout down here on Con Street is very small. My right? tractor trailers have to ride up on the middle. The one over at the bridge uh, turns around and it was supposed to calm down the traffic. I was in traffic the other day for 45 minutes before I got to the bridge. So, you know, it didn't calm down any traffic. It was better the other way. Yeah, there's accidents. There's accidents anywhere you go, right? And uh, and so, uh, you know, if the people had been involved in it, right, I think they either would have made the roundabout bigger so the tractor trailers and stuff like that can go around it. Then there's the idea of the bridges that we got in town that are not high enough for a tractor trailer to go under. Well, Roy, the question is about... The question was about um, whether you work on charter revision to give the city council more. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm getting to, right? You know, the, uh, the charter says that only certain people can talk. All right. And, you know, with the charter, you know, uh, I went over the charter with David Stevens. And David Stevens worked on it. You remember David, Mark? And he worked on the charter. And, uh, and he was telling me that there's some things in the charter he wasn't in favor of, but it was a vote by the people that was working on the charter. They voted it, and it went to the mayor. So I don't think I think the mayor should sit in front of the people to be answer answerable to the people, you know, right? Instead of sitting out in the audience and and always speaking when he's asked a question. Well, let's go back to the, looking at the people's question. Let's go on to the next question. Roy, you want to hear? You want to mute yourself? Um, the next question is from Lily Lombard. She says there's been great public debate over the redesign of Main Street with residents calling it our once in a generation opportunity in terms of safety, economic viability, transportation, and climate resiliency. Where do you stand on the current design option number three? Please offer specifics. And since if elected, you will be taking over this impactful project. How do you feel about the city's current timeline for submitting the 25% design plan to the Massachusetts Department of Transportation in December 2021, weeks before you are sworn in as mayor. We've already talked about this to some extent, but not entirely. So does anybody want to add to what you said earlier or in response to Lily's question? Sure. Um, I, you know, I mean, I've already stated where I stand on this and I, you know, this is an issue. I'm actually on the advisory committee for this for the Main Street redesign. Um, this is something that I've been working on for years. This has been a discussion for many, many, many years. There's actually been public meetings um, in the past about this. This is sort of not a new issue, although it's there's been a lot of public input recently about it. Um, and I'm prepared um, as mayor to, to take over having done extensive work on it. And, um, and you know, the timeline is, uh, if if the timeline is what it is, and we do have to get that 25% in, then um, I'm prepared to meet it. If we have a little bit more time, then um, then we'll work with that. But the key is that we need to not jeopardize this money. This money is very important. Um, we don't get money like this from the state almost ever. And so we need to make sure that we get this money um, and we meet the requirements to get it. But, you know, it, if we have a little bit more wiggle room to work on the design, I'd be happy to do that. So does anyone else want to give a brief answer? Just very quickly. Mark? Just that even with the 25% design, that still leaves 75% of design before you even turn a single brick. So there are opportunities for the next mayor to have an impact here. And in the remaining design, we can still deal with some big issues, including the, you know, the streetscape, the trees, the traffic flow, so that even the, even the dimensions of parking. So there are a lot of other things and supportive policies. Shauna? Roy? Yeah. 
I, I know that we spoke about this before, so I'll be brief. I think that there was not enough residents' input. I know that many uh, residents were very much in shock. So even though that uh, there has been debate, I think that um, this is an example that we need to slow the process and we cannot lose that this budget, but we also uh, are missing an opportunity to make a little bit more green investments, investments like uh, rapid charge um, uh, parking spaces for uh, electric vehicles. So I think that uh, a, a, if elected mayor, uh, I will be um, I will be very bold in sort of pushing the bucket and seeing what changes can we do with a time that we allowed it. Roy, yeah, unmute yourself, Roy. There, I got it. Uh, what I think is uh, that. We need to come up with a different plan because senior citizens don't ride bicycles, all right? Uh, families that come to town to go to the restaurants, they don't ride bicycles, all right? Uh, you know, you got a husband, a wife, and three kids. They come to town, all right? They want to go to a restaurant, all right? What do they do? They park way up in the parking garage and walk all the way down there? I don't think so, all right? Most of them that I see, they park right by the restaurants. So, and you know, and then that means that something has to be done about the parking ticket because the parking ticket only gives you X amount of time, right? And by the time you get back there, you hung up. You know, you've got a ticket. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. We've got, we've got a lot more questions, so we should finally move on. Me and myself. Roy, will you repeat yourself? <laughs> okay, the next question is from Dennis D. He writes, it is my understanding that the firefighters union is opposed to mandatory mandatory vaccines for their members. How will the candidates handle the issue of city department unions refusing the vaccines for their members? Who would like to begin? Mark. Sure, I, I think the, the firefighters are wrong on this one. The city and public safety, and I'm surprised actually that union is opposed to this. I know that there are other unions in the city that recognize that they want their members to be in a safe environment and they're happy to go and, and, and follow the, the mayor's lead, the state's lead in getting a, in having vaccines. One thing though, that there isn't a need for mandatory vaccines if you also say to them, okay, fine. If you're not gonna take a vaccine, you have to submit to regular testing. And I would like to go and negotiate with the union then in that case to have their members pay a higher share of their state uh, the GIC healthcare costs. I'm not sure if the state would allow that, but if there is a way to do that, I would think that would be an equitable thing to do. Shana? Yeah, I, I also, I'm, I'm pretty surprised that the firefighter unions first responders will oppose this mandatory vaccine. And I know that with President Biden now um, imposing a mandate vaccine to employers with over a hundred uh, employees, I think that we're gonna have a national debate on the eff efficiency of uh, mandates. I know that there's also some universities that are trying through the path of education um, and really making sure that everyone has the right evidence and making sure that science leads the way. And I think that we can come to a negotiation and I think that this is a no debate. We need to create everyone, everyone's safety and as first responders, they have a responsibility towards the residents. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Mark said, it needs to be uh, coupled with also testing because obviously anyone that is vaccinated can also be a carrier. Um, so I think that this is a, a very hot topic and a crucial topic because lives are in stake. Any, anybody else want to comment or the next question is, well, Gina. Oh, I was just gonna say, I, you know, I had not heard that the local 108 was um, a, opposing mandatory vaccines, but um, you know, I do hope that there will be more federal and state um, help or, or pressure, depending on how you want to look at it, um, to be able to mandate them. Um, and that, you know, I, I would lean on those resources as well. But I think, as Shauna was just saying, this is a very important safety issue, it, particularly for first responders. Roy? You. Okay, there. Uh, what I think is, I think that yes, right, if they want to be unvaccinated, but then if they go and they catch the, the disease, then what you can do is turn around and sue them, the ones that want to be unvaccinated, sue them, all right? And then if they got to put dollars up, they're going to either put dollars up or they're going to get vaccine. Uh, I'm in favor, I got my shot, you know, I got J&J, and uh, I wasn't going to get a shot, 
But then someone called me. David Stevens called me and says, hey, Roy, right over here, there's a J&J. I went right over there. So that was over in Holyoke. So uh, anyways, right, that's all I get to say is, you know, right, the ones that get the shots and are covered, great. And the ones that don't get the shots, if they get the disease, let them sue, let them get sued. Okay, so the next question um, is from Deborah Levy. It's, what are your ideas for making Northampton more affordable for renters? Roy, you need to mute. Okay. Who wants to take this one first? What are your ideas for making Northampton more affordable for renters? Shana. I think that, uh, first of all, we have to make a community, we have to uh, engage with a community assessment of our um, property values over here, as well as who owns property in Northampton and make sure that we do not have a monopoly of ownership over those that do not have resources. We have to do it with in line with climate justice and racial justice and really have creative solutions. We have to diversify our tax base and we have to ensure that when we have large properties uh, that we set aside some affordable living and that can be uh, there's technology out there for 3D printing homes. There's technology out there that we can use a village home to, uh, to store data and that data can create heat exchange for the community. We can have pods and community living. There are a lot of creative solutions out there, but the most important things that we have to include those impacted individuals, those that are fixed incomes, that are on benefits and make sure that we listen to them and that they lead the way uh, for these solutions. It cannot be a top-down approach. It has to be a bottom-up. Does anybody else want to comment? Mm -hmm. Mark? Uh, one thing that we did do when we had the second home on the lot uh, allowance that we didn't put in a planning uh, allowance for that home to be smaller than the one that's there. And as a consequence, as developers have done infill and in putting second houses on lots, they put big houses on lots and sold them for $700,000. If you had had a change in code, and you could have done this at the time that an infill uh, zoning plan was made to make for a smaller house, a proportion of what the existing structure is there, you would have had definitely a more affordable home that could have been used and affordable for renters. So I think that's one thing we could have done. It's time to revisit that. I would not impose a rent control on Northampton though. I think that leads to a deterioration of existing stock and fewer homes that are available for renters. So it's counterproductive. Gina. Um, well, rent control is actually not uh, legal in, in the Commonwealth, so that's not an option. Um, I would say, you know, I'm very proud of the, the work the city has done recently on dismantling old zoning restrictions that are exclusionary and, um, and are working to address some housing needs and affordability through zoning. We want zoning that creates more opportunity and housing for all. Um, and we also have to protect housing for those that are most vulnerable to losing it. Um, I wrote and sponsored a resolution supporting legal counsel for tenants in eviction cases. Um, this is state legislation and this is vital. You know, people go, you, uh, people would be in, at risk of losing their tenancy and they would go to court and their landlord would be lawyered up and they would not have any kind of counsel. So it's, it's vital that people who are at risk um, have counsel. Um, I'm also working currently on taking the burden of rental fees off of renters. Um, um, with a home rule petition to the state. So asking that um, for agencies that charge a fee, that the fee is uh, charged to the landlord instead of the renter, because that can be the difference between someone gaining a tenancy. That extra amount of money of that fee could be the thing that keeps someone from being able to um, get into a home. And the, you know, the service that is value added is really for the landlord and less for the renter. I think we have time for only a couple more yeah. questions. In one one quick sentence too, that the state doesn't allow uh, allow uh, rent control now, but there have been home rule petitions in Somerville and Boston, and I don't think that is advisable for Northampton. Sorry. Okay, uh, Roy, very briefly, and then we have time for one more question. Unmute yourself. Unmute, Roy. We have subsidized housing in Northampton. You know, I'm in subsidized housing. So we have that in Northampton. 
Now, we also have a lawyer, right? Uh, well, Bill Newman. Bill Newman takes a lot of cases, but I mean, he, he only takes the hard cases. But there's also other, uh, other lawyers down on Pleasant Street that do uh, this stuff on the people being evicted. I know that because I've been there before eh, over 20 years ago. I've been 21 years where I'm living now. So, and I ain't about to give it up. But, you know, right, some people just don't abide by rules, right? Just like in there, right? A lot of people don't abide by rules. So, right, it's going to make more homeless. And right now with the eviction the way it is, uh, people have just I've stepped on it. You know, and now they're saying, oh, I should have paid my rent. I should have paid my rent. Well, they should have paid their rent, all right? I don't feel sorry for them. They had the money. A lot of them are on Social Security and stuff like that. They had the money. They could have paid their rent all along. They thought they were getting away with something, all right? No, it's going to get away with in the state of Massachusetts. Okay, we need to move on. And I want people to know that we are, on, because we're on a webinar, we were not able, some people have said, why aren't you muting people? We are not able to do that. Do that and then you can't do it in webinars. We have one more question. It's from Meg Vandera, and it says, try to watch my bed. Um, Roy, wait, wait a second. Roy, can you mute yourself, please? I don't know. Thanks. Bad sidewalks are in bad shape and have been for a decade or more. There are no accessible unpaved trails on any of the city's conservation properties. The Disability Commission meets the senior center, meets in the senior center because City Hall lacks accessibility features. As mayor, how would you ensure residents with disability conditions or limited mobility due to age or medical conditions are no longer marginalized? Who would like to take that first? Shauna. Um, so I, we actually, during the campaign, we held a forum for any residents that want to come, part of the uh, campaign committee, uh, talking about universal design and disability justice as a special educator. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to me. Uh, and I think that, again, this is another area that we need to increase participation for those most impacted. It's Northampton is not disability friendly in any way on the trails, on the sidewalks, in the buildings. Um, I also know that um, someone shared with me during that forum that uh, hairdressers in Massachusetts are uh, have to be accessible and almost we have so many hairdressers that are uh, upstairs in Northampton. So I I know that there is funds also to, uh, and the state level to uh, support businesses and private residency to increase accessibility. We actually access some of those funds um, to ad adapt a house for uh, for my for my mother. Um, so there there is opportunity out there, and we need to be creative. And this needs to be happening now. We can't have accessibility entrances always in the back. Uh, side of the building. Universal design means that everyone can walk in from the same building and have accessibility without needing to uh, put their effort forward. I know that anybody with disability knows that it's, a, it's another job to be able to access benefit, to access medication, to access uh, anything in your life. So we needed a city to come together to make it easier for those most impacted. Any other? I know we're almost out of time, so I'll try and be really brief. Um, you know, I, I work for an organization that supports people with disabilities. This is something that's very, very important to me. I talked about sidewalks a little bit earlier. We did a comprehensive sidewalk study a few years ago, but people who walk on our sidewalks don't need a study to, to tell you that they're not accessible for a lot of people. Um, this is something that we, we have to work on, and I'm hoping that we will be able to leverage more, um, more federal funds to be able to do larger scale projects on this. Um, and I agree that we should have um, some trails that are accessible to people. And that's that's something else that I would like to seek funding for. Any final words from anyone else? And then we, we, we Mark? Just said, of course, the Americans with Disabilities Act has to set the stage and set the rules for what we do. And when we re, uh, rehabilitate any building, that has to keep that in mind. Uh, there are some trails that there's the bikeway is paved, so that part is accessible, but you have to balance that with uh, some other needs. I, I wouldn't go and redesign City Hall right now just because there is an entrance on the side and there is an elevator, so it is accessible. I, I, 
I'm not sure it'd be, be worth the millions of dollars uh, to just put it up as something from the front. Uh, but if it were a new building, of course, that is something that has to be front and center. We also just made the parking lot behind. We just invested um, grant money recently to make that more accessible. So when we designed this uh, um, forum, we plan to have questions for half an hour and then to have the candidates have the final word. Um, and I think we actually have a way to combine those two, those two, two, um, strat two things. One, Joan Wiener asked the, candidate, asked the question, what does each candidate think are their unique qualifications to be mayor? And in answering that, will you also speak to what Ken talked about before? We have only a few minutes left. Ken, do you want to say what they should speak to? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, me speak to in terms of how they're different, the, the dif differentiation. What makes what makes you? Uh, why should we vote for you? <laughs> what what makes you the the best candidate uh, for mayor? Well, how are you different? And how are you different from from uh, from others? So it's uh, we're we're just we're really just about out of time. Maybe take one minute each, and uh, and then we'll close. You want to choose the order? Uh, Gina Louise, uh, I'm going to just go uh, counterclockwise on my uh, screen. Gina Louise, uh, and Lee, you're first. Sure. Um, well, I'm the only candidate with elected municipal experience, and I have a lot of it. I've been a ward counselor, an at-large counselor, vice president of the council, uh, the council president right now. I've sat on many, many committees, held multiple leadership roles, and I'm currently the chair of the finance committee. Um, additionally, I have management experience in the political, the nonprofit, the academic, and most importantly, in the municipal sectors. Um, these roles have all given me the experience and the depth of understanding a better municipal government and what matters to Northampton, as well as how to lead the city. So that's great. Right. Mark? Sure. I think the strength, the two strengths that I bring here, one is my professional experience. This is what I've been doing, running, helping to go and run large public agencies, projects for them. I've designed my name on the top of the reports and contracts on our 50 major studies for public agencies throughout the country in the United States. The other piece too is that I think there is an issue of making sure that you don't yield to loud voices. You yield to reasoned voices and not to powerful players, but to powerful arguments. And I think the council in recent years has yielded to loud voices and it has left its role behind of making sure that the city represents the broader interests of the city as a whole. I don't come from just a progressive ideology. I'm very much a core solid Democrat. I have been my entire life, but it's an issue where the first thing you have to do is run your city well. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Shauna? I'm a social worker. I'm an educator. I'm bring, bringing the field experience to the table. I'm a harm reductionist that knows to value those impacted individuals. That, and we have no time to waste to make sure that those that are most disenfranchised are the ones that we make the budget work for the most. What I bring is bold, progressive values. I, I see myself the most leftist from, from all this group. And I really imagine that Northampton can be a model city. And I, and I see Black Lives Matter signs everywhere in the city, but I don't think that we're really truly holding our, ourselves accountable for true progressive reform. And that's what I bring to this table. Thank you, Shana. Last uh, comment, Roy, unmute yourself, please. <laughs> Okay, right for the last comment. Uh, first off, right, I was on that uh, disabilities committee, and at the time we only worked on one year issue. So, but, right, why would I be a good mayor? Because I'm willing to say I'm not boss of the people of the city. The people of my boss, the people come to me and say what they want and what they need. And I will work towards getting them that, but I'm not going to take stupid ideas and stuff like that, right? I mean, you get some homeless guy comes in off the street and he says, oh, hey, right, you know, I'd like to see uh, uh, 16 walkways on Main Street, you know, uh, and I think that a lot of veterans are getting shortchanged down in Northampton, so I think that's what, you know, my whole experience with Northampton since I've been here and everything. Well, I mean, I was here when I was a kid too. So, okay. but I think that everything put together, I would make a good man, all right? But even if I don't, 
come out one of the two in the end. I I hope. Thank you, thank you, Roy. If you can unmute yourself, I'd like to um, end end the webinar uh, by thanking uh, certainly thanking everybody. I thought the questions were great. I thought the answers were great. I know I've learned a lot. I want to particularly thank uh, Naomi and Sarah Lennox who worked with me on developing this forum and the questions. Uh, thanks, much thanks to Nina Kleinberg who um, uh, did all the technical stuff. <laughs> That's as technical as I get. And uh, certainly the uh, certainly the obviously the candidates, uh, Shauna, Roy, Mark, and uh, Gina Louise, and most uh, most assuredly, of course, the audience, the participants who, who joined us tonight. I think at the most, I think uh, maximum we had uh, something like 225, 250 people uh, joining us. So that's that's great. On behalf of Northampton neighbors, thank you. Have a good evening, and uh, go out and vote. Thank you.